Thank you, Phoebes. This is what people want. This is what the internet wants. So I'm sure it's no surprise to you. This episode's going to have a content warning, you know, for racism and misogyny. This is a video about women and the white power movement. What were you expecting? So to get started, I'm actually very curious about how this video is going to turn out because when I make videos about racists, you guys seem to love that. But when I make videos about women, I get something like a 38% decrease in views. So this video about racist women, I'm like genuinely curious about what the alchemy is going to be on that. So, so far in this series on the white power movement, we've been focused exclusively pretty much on men. And that makes sense. Uh, men are literally in all the leadership positions. This is a highly patriarchal misogynistic structure and patriarchy is not only a thing that they do, but embrace and hold proud to. But paradoxically, women were a really important part of the white power movement. They were much of the glue that held it together. And Without them, the organization basically couldn't run. So today we're going to look at what women's lives were like in this movement and what sort of roles they played within the greater white power ecosystem. We'll talk about the white power movement's concept of femininity and how gender was weaponized in order to push a racist agenda. Fun. Hi, I'm Tristan. This is Step Back. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification to never miss another Step Back video. This is Phoebe, by the way. I guess we should start with a bit of background. White womanhood has long been a centerpiece in the mental world of white supremacists. When you read what segregationists write about, there's a fixation on women's sexuality and the threat of men of color. You see in how the law in places like the American South and apartheid South Africa emphasized anti-race mixing laws. You see this in the ease in which black men have been condemned to death in America for often invented crimes against white women. The racist drive to frame their racism as protection of white women's sexuality runs deep and could be a video all its own. As well, the role of women in society underwent a seismic shift in the 20th century. During the second wave of women's liberation movements in the 1960s and 70s, women saw victories in reproductive and family planning rights, financial rights, right to work, and the like. Furthermore, a triumph of the civil rights movement was the death of anti-miscegenation laws, making being a mixed-race couple not a crime. Obviously, these victories were not nearly enough looking at the world today. Still, women's rights came a long way in a couple decades. But always, during that time of progress, there was a growing backlash. Conservative white people grew entire movements to try and roll back gains made during this period. They successfully achieved the death of an equal rights amendment to the Constitution, as an example. And by the 1980s, this reactionary backlash to women's rights had come home. They had an ally in the White House with President Reagan. The moral majority was a scarily large political power. Popular culture was now about denouncing and rejecting gains made in mid-century, as everyone spent the next 20 years stripping the United States for parts. While few white Americans would say they want to roll back women's rights or bring back anti-miscegenation laws, they had anxieties about people moving into their neighborhoods and worried about things going too far. Now that's just wider society and the subtle white supremacy that colors every part of our modern day. In the white power movement, they said the quiet part out loud and used this resentment for their own gain. Things like fighting race mixing and protecting the sexual ugh, purity of white women were among the chief motivations they cited for race war. In previous videos, we mentioned a significant movement in the white power world to move to the Pacific Northwest to create a white supremacist utopia. There, they intentionally planned to push a demographic change to their advantage. That's because women in the white power movement, first and foremost, were valued only as engines of reproduction. Women were encouraged to have as many kids as possible. Internal publications would mark births, and writing for and about women was laser focused on their role primarily as mothers and having pure white babies. Even people swearing into some white power groups had to make a pledge of defense to a 
white baby in a ceremony. This is because white supremacists are terrified of the idea of their numbers dropping. If you want to find the quickest way to point out someone who has white supremacist sympathies, listen for discussions of birth rates, population growth, and ideas of a quote, great replacement. I mean, as I write about this, crypto fascist news commentator and host of the most popular political show in television history, Tucker Carlson, the father Coughlin of our age, has been talking about it on his show. So yeah, the white power movement of the 80s put a high emphasis on ensuring women birthed as many babies as possible with white men. That part's very important to them. This meant that they were either domestic servants or sex prizes to be won. Even more punk white supremacists like the Nazi skinheads framed their untraditional women as primarily mothers. Within the movement of the Northwest, gender was rigidly categorized into cowboys and pioneer women. Their words, not mine. With that comes a whole slew of assumptions, such as the genocide of non-white people that land belongs to. It defines the man's life as one of action and violence, and women through domestic servitude. Not the biggest surprise, I'm sure. Women in the white power movement who had any form of real prominence usually rose to those positions by either being the wife of prominent white power members, like white Aryan resistance leader Tom Metzger's wife Kathleen Metzger, or they were widows of martyrs to the cause. Beyond that, their status rarely went above promised sexual rewards for male warriors. Now here's the fundamental paradox that a lot of women in this movement seem to express. They did organize and often complained about not being taken seriously in a consciously virulent anti-feminist movement. Groups like the Aryan Women's League managed operations within their activities, which one might define as feminine or domestic, like education, child raising, and memorializing dead warriors. Again, a lot of this meant the majority of the labor that goes into, you know, maintaining a movement and operating camps so the men could just go out and, you know, play with their guns all day. They served as the social glue that held together the white power movement. Social networks, recruitment, and cultural products like education materials fell under their purview. When the men went out to inflict terror or, you know, violence on their local community, women were getaway drivers, disguisers, and burners of incriminating evidence. They also tended to fix all of the spelling mistakes and grammar errors in their literature. But one of the most essential roles in the white power movement was to act as a humanizing element for them when they interacted with the outside world. They'd perform a vulnerable femininity in court cases and in the media. They'd take a country full of misogynistic and racist resentment to progress made in the last two decades and use it to frame neo-Nazis and Klansmen as sympathetic. One such example was performed by Lewis Beam's fourth wife, Sheila. Shortly after their wedding, Lewis Beam was issued charges of seditious conspiracy and ordered to report for trial. The couple fled south to Mexico, along with Lewis's seven-year-old daughter. For four months, he was on the FBI's most wanted list. They caught up with him, and the group were apprehended by Mexican federal police. Seeing her husband being arrested at gunpoint, Sheila shot a federal officer three times. And here's where the tail weaving begins. Her affidavit was a perfect example of what I'm describing with the performance. It described her as a vulnerable, innocent white woman held by Mexican authorities without protection from big, burly white men. She wrote of brutal mistreatment at the hand of racialized others, making a note to refer to the darkness and dirtiness of Mexican officials, playing right into the cultural anxiety of white women being violated by racialized men, as I've kept talking about. Returning to the US, she played the role of martyr to gain sympathy from the press, legal system, and broader public for the white supremacist cause. And you know what? It worked. Press coverage of the most powerful Klansman in America's wife was overflowing with sympathy. Who she was married to and what she was arrested for were not even mentioned. Once released, she then went to see Louis at his seditious conspiracy trial to perform the same role for her husband. And we can't say what role her uh, performance played in this, but he was eventually acquitted, of which Sheila, reportedly fainted over, despite showing evidence of weapons making and an extensive network of white power terrorists planning for war on the United States 
As he left the court of free man, Sheila in his arms, he said that he was giving up on the terrorism thing to focus on books and, quote, raising blonde headed children. It was seen as another resounding victory by the white power movement and a further sign that the government and people were on their side. And the concept of weaponizing gender to justify a racist agenda continues to this day. You still see strong currents in American uh, culture that demonizes the sexuality of black men and essentially uses the threat of violence against pure virginal white women and the threat of race mixing as a way to justify the oppression and violence of people of color. This is a common refrain in the backlash against the civil rights movement, and you still see it today in the way that people like Tucker Carlson talk about on their show. And this stuff isn't harmless. It's led to the oppression and death of lots of people. A lot of the people who looked the other way for the white power movement did so uh, thinking that racism was over when the police still won't stop mass murdering black people. And it's really important to understand that our male dominated society does play some role in that. Anyways, watch the rest of the series and I'll see you guys at the next one.